Hello everybody, welcome back, this is Chris, uh, and as promised, today we're going to be talking about the uh, implementation of LoRa. So we're going to walk through a notebook which has a simple implementation, and uh, that's what we're going to do today. I'm not going to set this up in any kind of uh, specific fashion, so all of the models and data that I'm using are totally interchangeable, totally reliant on what you want to achieve. Uh, but we're going to go through an example today that's straightforward and hopefully, you know, lets you understand one of the ways that we can uh, fine tune using LoRa. So, as always, we're going to have to get some dependencies. Um, you are going to want to make sure that you get the most up to date versions of both PEFT and Transformers. Um, these are libraries that are changing at a very fast pace right now. So please keep in mind that uh, you know some of the quirks or bugs that uh, I might tell you about in this video may be fixed by the time you actually get to implementing this. So we're going to be relying on a few libraries to help us today. We're going to be relying on Accelerate, Lib, and Peft. Now, the Peft library from Hugging Face is the parameter efficient fine tuning library. And it is what gives us access to the LoRa model uh, and it is what gives access to the LoRa method of parameter efficient fine tuning. So parameter efficient fine tuning or PEFT, as I'll refer to it for the rest of the video, is a broad kind of umbrella term for uh, fine tuning methods that are parameter efficient, which means that they aren't just fine tuning the whole model. Now, LoRa is a subset of PEFT, so LoRa is a specific method or application of PEFT, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. After you do this, you're just going to want to make sure that you have CUDA available. The model that I'm using today is going to be the Bloom 3B model. It is going to take roughly 40 gigabytes of GPU RAM. You can use the Bloom 1B7 model, and it will take less than 16 gigabytes of GPU RAM, depending on your data set. So I would definitely look to use the smallest model that you can, depending on what resources you have. So I'm using Colab Premium. We can see that by going to Runtime, Change Runtime Type, and you can see that I have GPU, Premium, and Standard. So if you want to follow exactly this, you will need Premium, so Colab Premium. Uh, but if you want to use the Bloom 1B7 model, you will not need premium at all, which is fantastic. Uh, again, depending on your data set, right? So the if you have a very large data set, and I don't mean many rows, I mean if each item in your data set is large, then you're going to be struggling for enough GP RAM to keep up. So why are we using Bloom? Well, let's take a look at Bloom. First of all, it's decoder only. It is a causal language model, and it has a ton of parameters, including a fairly permissive, uh, you know, token max length. So we're able to squeeze a lot of context in here, which is fantastic. Additionally, it has a fairly reasonable vocabulary size. Bloom is definitely not the best model to fine tune for every application, but it is very good. One of the reasons it's very good is that it's trained on a fairly large set of languages, including code. And if you can see in the code, it's trained on quite a lot of common programming languages. So I like Bloom because it is, first of all, relatively easy to fine tune. Second of all, relatively multilingual. So it can be fine tuned on a number of different languages, which is always a benefit. And then number three, this reason, it has a permissive license. The Big Science Rail license is fantastic because it basically says you're chill to do what you want as long as you follow these rules. These are the use restrictions set forth in the Big Science Rail license. And they essentially amount to don't do bad stuff with the model, uh, which is something I can get behind. So that's why we're using Bloom. We do need to use the auto model for causal LM. Again, this is a causal language model. So we need to be cognizant that we're always keeping that in mind when we're making selections for our parameters. We are going to use uh, floating point 16 for this. It just reduces the amount of memory it takes up. That's fantastic. You know, the reduced precision doesn't really hurt us here. That's great. 
We're also using device map auto. This is a feature of Accelerate from Hugging Face. It lets the uh, it lets the model layers exist across multiple devices if it's necessary. Now you will run into some errors if you choose to do that. Uh, you will have to make some tweaks in order for it to work properly, but it is an option and it's a very powerful option. So you don't have to have enough compute anymore to train your model. Listen, it will train slower without having enough compute, but you can shove a lot of it onto RAM and, uh, and it will still run. We're just using the uh, Big Science Tokenizer. Uh, that's it. It's, uh, we need a tokenizer and this is the one that we're using. As you can see, the model itself is quite large. So when I download the model, you're gonna see that it is 6.01 gigabytes of model. That's quite big. And so we want to you know, be aware of that. Um, this is why we need enough GPU RAM. As much as you know, LoRa is an efficient fine tuning method, Bloom is still 3 billion parameters. Once the model's loaded, we're gonna go ahead and print it. Thanks, PyTorch. As an aside, we are using Torch 2.0 in the notebook, but it doesn't really matter. We're not taking advantage of any of the optimizations put forward in Torch yet. Uh, once the Hugging Face libraries uh, find a way to include it, I'm sure it will be there. But as of right now, it just takes some extra fiddling, and so I don't think it's necessarily worth, uh, worth the time. Why do we want to print the model? Well, if you remember from the LoRa paper, we need to choose which weight matrices we want to decompose and learn the decompositions of. In the paper, they chose WQ and WV, which is the uh, query and value. Bloom doesn't have that specific delineation, but we do have the query key value module, which is what we're going to go ahead and use. So this is the module we're going to target with our fine tuning. This is going to be different depending on the model that you select. So if I loaded a different model, I would need to use a different module to target with LoRa. So say for instance, if I wanted to do the llama style models, I would use proj Q and proj V. That is the specific modules that we would be targeting there. But for Bloom, we're just going to use the query key value uh, module as our target. We're gonna do some pre-processing here. This is not strictly necessary, uh, but it does help improve training stability. And so why not, right? We have a helper function that just helps us see and visualize why LoRa is so dang good. And then we have kind of the crux of the notebook, which is setting up our LoRa config. So this is going to let us set our rank. So that's the number of dimensions that we're going to limit our decomposed matrices to. So uh, in this case, it would be the uh, you know rank by the initial dimension and then the initial dimension by the rank for the two decomposed matrices. We have our alpha, again, they didn't talk about a lot in the paper how to determine this. I have been going with double and it's been working fine, uh, but you can kind of you choose whatever works best for you. This is a very important piece. Remember that LoRa can apply to any weight matrix, right? So we can inject those two uh, decomposed matrices in the place of any weight matrix in the model. In this case though, we want to choose the weight matrix for the attention mechanism so we're going to go ahead and do that by targeting query key value. Again, if we look at our model, we can see that we have all of these modules. We have a bunch of these blocks of modules, right? And we are going to go ahead and inject it to every one of the query key value sub modules in this block of, uh, you know, 30 modules. So hopefully that's clear. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. We could also, like it said in the paper, target our MLP uh, weights, but we just don't want to, for the purposes of this uh, video, we're trying to stick relatively close to what Laura put out. We have our dropout. Again, uh, dropout serves the same purpose here as it would in any other machine learning task. We don't care about biases, so we can set that to none. Lastly, we wanna make sure that our task type is set to causal LM. This is just because Bloom is a causal language model. 
If we were using, say, a masked language model, we would set this to a different parameter, but we're not, so we choose causal LM. This is dictated entirely by your model choice. Now we can use from the PEFT library the helper function get PEFT model, which accepts both a model and this LoRa config and then returns a model that has all of those injectable uh, matrix, that has all those injectable matrix pairs already slotted in. And yes, it is that easy. Uh, a lot of the times where we're talking about these, you know, these tasks or these kind of interesting sounding applications, you know, places like Hugging Face have already done a lot of work to make actual implementation of them quite straightforward. We can then use our uh, helper function that we put above here to get the number of trainable parameters of our model. And as you can see, this is the benefit of LoRa. We are going to be fine tuning less than a tenth of a percent of the parameters of this model. And the results will blow your mind. You know, that's not even clickbait. They really will. <laughs> like, this is the power of LoRa, right? We're able to go from 3 billion parameters to less than 2.5 million parameters. Insane. The data we're going to be using today is the Squad V2 data set, which is just a kind of question answer data set. It's got context, it's got some questions, and it's got some answers. So we're going to be fine tuning our Bloom 3B model on that data set to see if we can get it good at some kind of extractive question answering. This is not something that Bloom is good at normally, which is not something that the Bloom model is traditionally good at. Uh, but we want it to be. And so that's what fine tuning is for. We're going to give the model our questions and answers in context in this format. We're going to be focusing on a very uh, simple to understand example that's relatively naive. If you want to go deeper on it, uh, you know, we run some workshops at Fourth Brain that uh, might go into more depth in the future on these topics. But for right now, we're just going to get this thing going. I think that's the easiest way to start understanding the fine tuning process of these models is just getting something that works. You can see it working and then kind of evolving from there. So again, we're gonna be feeding it this exact thing for every question over and over again, right? This is the training process. We're just showing it this. And what we want it to learn is not the content. What we wanted to learn is the structure. So what that means is we're not teaching the model all of the things in the questions we're showing it. We're trying to show it that, hey, you know, when you see this string of characters or combination of tokens and then some context, and then you see this combination of tokens and then some query, we expect you to answer relative to these two things We've also included the stop token just so it knows to stop, doesn't keep running over forever. But that is what we're doing. That's the goal today. So I'm a big proponent of this idea that fine tuning is for structure, not knowledge. It isn't specifically true in the sense that you, it's not like you can't teach a model new things. I just feel like it's incredibly inefficient. And sometimes the idea is you want to teach these models new things when there are easier ways you can approach that specific problem. Once we have this desired format, all we need to do is put our uh, question and answer data set into that format. So we go ahead and do that using this helper function. It's going to map all of the data sets to this specific prompt. You can see that being done here. Also, if there's no answer provided, we're going to show the model that it's allowed to respond with cannot find answer. This is helpful because we want the model to be able to say, I don't, I got no clue, man, right? So that's why we include that cannot find answer when there's no answer. It's just an easy way to let the model say it doesn't know. And we'll be back when this is done being mapped. All right, now that that's done mapping, we can. We're gonna be using the Transformers Trainer class here. This makes this process so straightforward. Number one, we include the model. This is the model we set up above with the PEF helper function. This has the LoRa config set up in it, which means that we've injected these uh, rank eight or max rank eight uh, matrix pairs into each of the places that we'd expect to see the actual weight matrix. We also have set up our uh, training half of the mapped QA data set 
We have our training arguments class, which includes the number of, uh, you know, uh, what's the batch size per device. We're using one device, so the batch size is just going to be four. Uh, we have our gradient accumulation steps. Shouldn't be necessary, but we set it anyway. We have our warm-up steps. We have the max number of steps. You'll note that this is 100, so there's no way we're getting through our entire data set. But again, we're not trying to give our model all that knowledge. We are just trying to show it the, the, the pattern, right? We're trying to teach it what the structure of our prompts is and what they should be doing. We have our learning rate set to a completely standard, uh, you know, uh, learning rate. Listen, there's so much literature about what to set the learning rate to these days that you just look up whichever paper you like the most and choose that one. We are using the floating point 16, uh, so we have to set this to true. I just like seeing it log out at every step. You can choose whatever you'd like. And of course we have our output directory. Say we wanted to use epochs here and we wanted to use validation. How we do that? Well, we can check out the trainer docs. The trainer docs gives us everything we need to uh, proceed in a way that makes sense to us. You can see here that we can set our eval data set. So that would be say the validation half of our mapped QA data set. When we look at our training arguments class, we can see that we have this do eval uh, boolean that we can use. Uh, we can look at our evaluation strategy. We can look at things like our max number of training epochs instead of steps. We can use the torch compile backend. Uh, this is the key here. We don't guarantee any of them will work as the support is being progressively rolled out by PyTorch. So we're, we're going to kind of ignore that for now. We can set the number of evaluation steps, so the number of steps between each evaluation, or we can have it do it at the end of each epoch. Anyway, the documentation is basically your best friend here. It's going to tell you everything you need to know. Uh, the documentation is incredibly robust, so I would definitely look it up if you have any questions or if you want to do anything outside of this demonstration. But for today, this is what we're going with. Now, finally, of course, we need to include this MLM equals false flag because we are not a mass language model. So can't use that. We're just using this to get rid of warnings. This is uh, taken from a hugging face tutorial. So, uh, you know, I've left it in because it removes warnings and that's fantastic. Once we've completed setting up our trainer class, we can just call dot train on it. You know, dot train is the new dot fit. If you remember from SK learn, uh, we are in we are in the dot train world now. And as you can see, this will just start training and we'll be back when it's done. All right, now that it's done, we can see that uh, the loss has gone down some. We're not really concerned with this training loss. Like it's just training loss. We're not training on the whole thing. We're not doing any validation. We don't care about any real metrics. Um, it's good to know, but we're really just, we want the model to have learned what we need it to have learned. So we're going to check that now. Now, you're gonna be able to save this to Hugging Face using Hugging Face's fantastic API. All you have to do is set your token in there and you're good to go. You'll also notice that during training, we did use quite a bit of GPU memory. Um, so we spiked around the 36 gigabyte range. Again, that's due to the fact that we chose the 3 billion parameter model. And because we're using a rather hefty data set, some of the contexts included in squad can get quite long. Now we just need to name our model and then we push it to the hub. So I've called it squad bloom 3B and that's it. Once we've pushed it to the hub, you'll notice first things first, this is all we need to push to the hub. Less than 10 megabytes, right? Because that's all we're training. We're just training those decomposed matrices. So we don't even need that much you know, bandwidth to store this entire adapter. Again, it's not technically an adapter because the adapter is an overloaded term, but it, this is our injectable decomposed matrix pairs, right? So that's all it takes to store them is less than 10 megabytes. Absolutely fantastic. Then we can reload the model. All right, and once that sucker's loaded, we're ready to rock. Now, I want to show you guys something that to me is mind blowing, okay? This is the part that's to me insane about Laura. Let's just let's just get rid of this, right? Okay, boom. We got rid of it. 
Now QA model is equal to none. Let's reinitialize this PEFT model. Now, both both the model and the PEFT model exist currently locally. We've already set them up, right? We've we've already given them their like we've downloaded the files, so they're already set up. But I mean, but like it loads it in what can only be described as no time flat, right? And this is part of the advantage of the LoRa system right? These are hot swappable entities. We, we can fine tune a bunch of different LoRa tasks and then just even at time of inference, because the reduction, like the inference latency introduced by loading it is minimal, we can actually go ahead and we can get this going so quickly, right? So here you go. Okay, so I know what you're saying. You're saying, Chris, I don't believe you. You're a big liar. Well, I've just gone ahead and restarted the runtime. I'll do it again here while it, while it's recording. You can see we're initializing the runtime. Nothing in GPU RAM, nothing in system RAM. All right, hype. Let's click this button to go. So we're going to load our base model here. This is something we're going to want to do at the beginning of our application startup, right? We don't want to do this every time someone hits the endpoint because that would be ridiculous. But we do want to do it every time that, uh, you know, the application or the container we're running this on loads at the start. So it's part of the warm up process, right? That's just like a classic uh, way to save some time. So we've got that. We've already downloaded pre-trained PEF model. So what happens when you click QA model here? And that's it. That's how long it took to get that QA model set up with that specific adapter. Now, let's say we wanted to load a different PEFT model. Would we have to hold the whole model structure in memory to do that? Well, we've got another one. I've trained more than one of these things. So let's call this QA model V2. PEFT model from pre-trained model PEFT model ID. Let's load that sucker. Look how fast that loaded. We're not taking up additional GPU RAM, right? This is the power of PEFT. It's so fast. We can do. We can load these models at inference time, right? It doesn't introduce a tremendous amount of latency to do this. So I know what you're saying. You're saying, hey, what, what if we had a different model? How about that? Well, let's try that. So this is the market mail model with downloading actual information itself. So that less than 10 megabyte file, we already have this model loaded. That is with the download from Hugging Face Hub, right? Think of how little inference latency is introduced here. Yes, over the course of tens of millions of calls, every bit of inference latency adds up, of course, please. But this is the thing. We don't need to have a whole brand new model to do this. We don't need to have a, uh, you know, so much extra headroom. We can just load our base model and then inject layers into it like a dream. So let's see how this thing works. We're gonna go ahead and load our QA model, make sure it's loaded. And we're going to run a query through it. This is just a helper function that does that. We have the simple context, cheese is the best food. We have the simple query, what is the best food? We go ahead and click this button. It says make inference. We get that the answer is cheese. Cheese is the best food. All right, let's look at a different example. Uh, the context is cheese is the best food. And the question is how far away is the moon from the earth? We make inference, it cannot find the answer. Let's use longer context, right? Look at all this context, beautiful. Go ahead, click the uh, the button. What distance does the moon orbit the earth? And it correctly extracts the correct answer. And this is all done on less than 40 gigabytes of VRAM. It took a grand total of less than 30 minutes to do the whole process, right? That's the power of LoRa. We built a model that is much better at this task than the base model. The base model fails at this consistently and fantastically, but we built a model that does it well-ish. Okay, you know, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not, but it is fine. And we built it in no time flat.
right? That's the power of LoRa. That's the power of being able to train these massive three billion parameter models in like, you know, 10 minutes on a single consumer level GPU, right? Now, again, one of the other powers is if we get our market mail model going, which is just uh, from a, a fourth brain workshop that, uh, that I did before, you can check out the video on fourth brains channel. But if we do that here, and we use our, you know, product name is the Coolinator and a personal cooling device to keep you from getting overheated on a hot summer's day as our actual, uh, you know, product description. We can go ahead and run that. It is going to take a second because this one has a lot more uh, tokens to generate. And we get a fairly reasonable marketing email uh, generated, you know, and again, we, we haven't reloaded the model at any point here. We, the, the actual model itself, so the base model, which is the uh, model here, which is just our Bloom 3B model, hasn't been loaded again, right? These are just those PEFT injectable matrices that we're injecting, and this is what we get. Suffice to say, this is a fantastic thing. Um, it's a very powerful tool, very powerful to fine-tune models with it. Uh, I suggest you you give it a shot. Again, you can run this in Colab um, and and fiddle around with it and see if you can build. If you build anything cool, please let me know. Uh, we had someone in a workshop build a uh, natural language to SQL converter when Bloom is not even trained on SQL, right? That's how powerful LoRa is. And again, not to belabor a point, but I really want you guys to focus on this number, the trainable percent less than a tenth of a percent, less than a tenth of a percent of the trainable parameters for using LoRa. And we get results that are fantastic. And this is on a hundred steps with no validation. We just showed the model a bunch of examples and those matrices learned that task very well. So thank you very much, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much for watching. If you like the video, please, uh, you know... <laughs> Smash that like button, subscribe if you want. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do the YouTube thing, but uh, I just like making these videos. They're fun. Uh, if it adds value to you, though, click the like button or whatever, and uh, we will see you in the next one.